This is episode 65 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Viado. Today we are going to be talking about stress. Stress is something we all experience, we all struggle with. And what's different about today's conversation is that we are going to deepen our understanding of stress by taking a closer look at the brain. Dr. Melanie Greenberg is going to talk to us about the brain's stress response, how the brain is wired, why it responds the way it does, what makes stress toxic, and specific tips for building a brain that's resilient to stress. Dr. Melanie Greenberg is a practicing psychologist and executive coach in Marin County, California, and an expert on managing stress, health, and relationships using proven techniques from neuroscience, mindfulness, and cognitive behavioral therapy. With more than 20 years of experience as a professor, writer, researcher, clinician, and coach, Dr. Greenberg has delivered workshops and talks to national and international audiences. She writes the Mindful Self-Express blog for Psychology Today and is a popular media expert who has been quoted on CNN, Forbes, BBC Radio, ABC News, Yahoo Shine, and Lifehacker, as well as in Self, Redbook, Men's Health, Women's Health, Fitness Magazine, Women's Day, Cosmopolitan, and The Huffington Post. Dr. Greenberg has also appeared on radio shows like Leading with Emotional Intelligence, The Best People We Know, Inner Healers, and Winning Life Through Pain. She was also named one of the 30 most prominent psychologists to follow on Twitter. Hi, Dr. Greenberg, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, good to be here. Thank you so much for spending um, some time with me today to talk about something that so many women, I would say all women, (laughs) struggle with an experience to varying degrees and at varying levels of awareness. And what this is, is stress. And so I was very excited to see that you had written a book that talks about how the brain responds to stress. So thank you again for being here. You're welcome. I'm excited to be here and share the knowledge with your listeners. Um, I'd like to start with just asking, how did you get drawn into this area of stress and the brain? So I have had a life that's had a lot of changes in it. I, I grew up in South Africa towards the end of apartheid. And it was a, a stressful time in the society at Port Height. It was still strong at the time I graduated college. And I had to make a lot of difficult life choices at quite a young age. And I ended up coming to the U.S. to study psychology. And through that, I've become a mom. I have have my family in the U.S., but other family in South Africa. I was a professor. So I've gone through a lot of life changes and had to make decisions, juggle different things. And I think from my own experience, I've realized that the ability to manage stress is key, that life throws things at you, you can't always predict, but that if you can develop a solidness within yourself, that that can really help you with whatever life throws at you, whether it's the day-to-day stuff of the rushing around or whether it's the major things that life throws at you. And I I remember hearing from another guest that, when it comes to anxiety and that that comes from an accumulation of stress. So when we talk about stress, it's also stress can also pile on top of other stressors and that it can actually add to the the impact on the individual. I think that's true. I think this stress is an, an inevitable part of life and it's not unhealthy in itself to have a situation that's a challenging to you that you then learn to adapt to or develop skills or kind of psych yourself up and get through it. 
But I think it is when it becomes chronic or when there's lots of stuff all layered on top of each other that it can overwhelm you, sometimes overwhelm your nervous system, or that the cortisol of just being on all the time, of being stressed and overwhelmed all the time can also affect your health. So it can be that if sitting in traffic is unpleasant, but if you're sitting in traffic and you also maybe have an elderly parent with Alzheimer's and you also have a marriage problem and you have other situations, maybe financial stress, the accumulation makes the sitting in traffic even more stress, likely to send you over the top. I like how you um, you said that stress is normal, <laughs> that it's part of life and actually that it's it's something that we we all deal with and it's inevitable because I think that to some degree, stress has kind of gotten a bad rap. You know, like you, you don't want to have stress and stress is not good. And so I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. It's like almost how can you live without stress? Right. <laughs> yeah. And then that sets you up to fail because you can't. If that's your, yeah, that's your expectation. Exactly. So I think it's more about understanding that stress is going to be there, but learning how to be resilient to it and maybe learning to change the way you look at it so it's not quite as stressful for you. And then I think also on the flip side of, um, you know, making stress, you know, this huge, awful thing that you want to not have in your life. On the other end, um, I think that we can get very immune to stress. And so a lot of people are stressed and don't know it. I think that's true. And what happens then is that it, it accumulates and has effects in ways that you don't even realize. One is muscle tension. You, you might end up with pain, for back pain or something like that, just because you weren't really tuned in to you know, how your muscles were tensing up all the time. And so you never learned how to, how to be mindful of that and actually breathe in a way that would be preventative. And sometimes when, I, when we don't realize we're stressed, we can suddenly burst out and be grumpy with our children or we have a road rage or send off an email that we regret. So it really is important to be mindful of how you're, much stress you're under so that you can you know, keep it in reasonable limits. And so what I'd like to do for our listeners is lay out the, the building blocks as we, as we go into our topic. And so could you please start with mapping out for us, you know, the significance of the brain in responding to stress. And because I know that, you know, there are different parts that do different things. And I just want our listeners to know what we're talking about as we move forward. Sure. So I think by understanding the brain, you can get a handle on stress and on psychological issues generally. Understanding the brain gives you insights that you wouldn't normally get that can often be actually quite healing to you because sometimes people blame themselves and think, oh, why am I such a mess or why am I reacting in such a dysfunctional way, whereas actually it's your brain's wiring. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, we're wired to respond to stress. We have a fight, flight, freeze response. And what that is, there's a part of our brain called the amygdala, and it's an almond-shaped structure in the center of the brain. And it's kind of like this, the fire station or the smoke alarm, it's, it's designed to make us alert to something important that we, sh we need to then divert our attention and resources to dealing with that thing. So originally, for our ancestors, that might have been f facing a lion or a tiger or a marauding tribe. And so what happens, it's a very rapid kind of response. Once the amygdala decides that there's a threat, everything goes very fast. So it, it signals then to kind of rev up your body with cortisol and adrenaline and various hormones and, and neurotransmitters that would be ready to deal with something right now, that kind of like a tiger. The problem is that the stresses we have today are often not like that, and they're much more prolonged and complicated and, and cognitive. And so that very rapid physiological response can sometimes get in your way if it's not an emergency situation. There's another part of your, our brain called the prefrontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex is, is behind, just behind your forehead, and it's your brain's kind of executive center, or almost like the CEO of your brain, and that has a much more mindful response. It can send information back to the amygdala saying, let's look at the situation in a more complex way, like 
calm down, don't overreact, you know, you know, in the past this happened and, and you did it this way, so this would be the best thing to do. But what we need to do is kind of slow down the response enough that the prefrontal cortex can get on board because initially the amygdala gets the information first to generate an emergency response. So if you, but if you slow it down, then there's time for the thinking parts of your brain to get on board. I want to give you an example. If you're walking in the woods and you see something that looks like a snake, what happens? You'll, you'll get a physiological reaction and you'll kind of jump or maybe even you know run before your brain can even say the word snake or even really have a cognitive concept of it because that's how our emergency responses are wired just to get the heck out of there when there's something dangerous. So you might have that reaction and then, you know, then you suddenly realize, oh, it's actually just a stick. And then everything's, you know, you can, everything starts calming down. So your amygdala is the one that ju- makes you jump and your prefrontal cortex is the one that says, wow, it's just a stick. Just, you know, calm everything down. That's a great example. I like that. <laughs> So, you know, the key, that's why, in a way, mindfulness, breathing, all that is important. It's important when you get a stress response to slow things down so you can actually just think it through what's the best thing to do here and not just be automatically reactive. And that's interesting because usually, you know, I know for me, when I'm stressed, I'm usually moving faster. So you can see how that actually, um, you know, really just makes things worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's if if it's not mindful, if it's not if it's not directed. So you know, I think it's okay to move fast. You know, if you have an overarching goal and you've got to get a bunch of stuff done, and you're just kind of going through it. But if it's not if it's not directed, sometimes I think what your amygdala can do is like, got to do something, got to do something, got to. And so you know, you you might do something, but it may not be the best thing to do. It may it may not help. It may just wear you out, or it may even harm things. That if you, you know, for example, if you're having a difficult conversation and you're just, you know, blurting out in kind of a hostile way uh, because you're in fight or flight, that that would be much less effective than if you actually actually think through what's your goal, you know, what do I want here, what's the other person capable of, you know, how can we sort of both deal with this together, for example. So it's if the activity is mindful, then that is actually okay. It's when it's not, and you are kind of just impulsively moving in any direction or this reminds me too of maybe that sense of being very scattered where you are yeah. going in lots of different directions like spinning your wheels exactly you know that you exactly and you sometimes you can be spinning your wheels and you know not really focusing just right this overarching sense that you've got to get things done but you don't really complete any task well something like that the other thing though is is we are wired naturally the most healthy thing to do it. We're wired to face a threat, to kind of gear up all our energy. So if you think of of fighting a tiger or something, like you gear up all your energy, you you run as fast as you can. But then, you know, when the tiger's gone, then then there's time to calm down and find your food, for example. So we're wired really, uh, and what's most healthy for us is to react strongly to a threat. But then to kind of calm down as well, you know, to recover quickly and then to have a period of where we kind of relaxed and, you know, get it and not stressed and we can kind of, you know, whole body can recover before we have to face the next stressor. But often, you know, with the information age, it's not like that. There's always something coming at you, whether it's another email or um, rushing, you know, to have to be in traffic and have to get somewhere and then immediately have to be somewhere else. So the other, that's the other problem is that our nervous systems don't really get a chance to recover the way they should. And so there's this ongoing experience of being in that triggered or high-stressed position. Yeah, and that's when you – so cortisol in itself, if it's just acute, just having you know cortisol and the adrenaline, it's, it's not harmful just in an acute way. But it's just when it's there all the time, when there's chronically high levels of it that's what ends up kind of dysregulating a lot of your biology because it causes inflammation and you don't, even the rhythm of your heart, like your heart, you know, doesn't get a chance to sort of go up and down in smooth waves, which would be the healthy way. But it's when it's, when it's always on that, that over time it wears you down, it wears down your mind and your body. So is this what you, what you refer to when you write about, you know, the acute stress and the chronic stress? 
That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's one aspect of it. The other, I think there's various aspects, I think, that sort of make stress more toxic. So one is that, you know, how chronic it is when, when there's no chance to recover or you don't, it's just always there. Somehow your mind can't let go of it. And, you know, so maybe you have a stress at work, you know, a difficult boss, for example, but then you come home and you, and you worry about the boss all evening and ruminate about it. That would be an example of, of not giving you, having a chance to recover. So that's one thing that's toxic. The other thing is when they pile up on each other, like we talked about. And the th- another way that that can be t- more stressful is when things are out of your control. Like no matter what you do, that you can't really affect the outcome and, and or you don't feel like you can. And it's a very important outcome. Um, so unemployment would be a good example of that. You, know, you, you apply for a whole bunch of jobs, but they, you, you can't really have control over when you're going to get a job or what job you're going to get. You have some control. That's also very stressful for humans is the sense of, of just not being able to have control over what's going to happen or be able to predict. Wow. So you can really see how, you know, in addition to our own personal lives, even what's happening out in the world can add to that stress. If you have a sense of not feeling safe or things are out of control, and this could be, you know, good at work, it could be um, in the world at large. That's a really good point. So the American Psychological Association did a survey. They always do the survey every year called the Stress in America Survey, and they measure the level of stress in America and you know, these thousands of people that participate. And in 2017, for the first time in the 10 years of the survey, they found a significantly, in- a statistically significant increase in anxiety. Wow. Compared to the previous year. So it's like we're more stressed than ever before. And at that time, it was post-election. You know, politics is a big piece. People weren't sure about the future of the country. And now we also have terrorists and hurricanes and and so I think it's I think it's stressful times. You know, there's also changes in the workplace and yeah, uh, in the in people's jobs and and there's yeah. So there's a lot going on that that I think these are stressful times for for everybody. That's so interesting because I have noticed too since around I guess post election or even before a lot more clients coming in with anxiety or increased anxiety. And and talking about external events, you know, that wasn't very common prior to that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the election kind of highlighted it. And there's a bit of a lack of predictability. But I think there's also not, you know, a sense things are polarized. Yeah. Yeah. That, that can be stressful for people as well. So, you know, I'm thinking of, since our audience is primarily women, a lot of women are, are working moms. They are, you know, juggling careers or businesses, and then they are also running a household, and they're exhausted. And I think, sure. I think that's another piece of this too is the is the physical exhaustion is a stressor. You know, just being tired. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. not getting enough sleep. Yeah, and so you know, what are some ways that you can start to bring the prefrontal cortex online and slow things down? And also, you know, when something is chronic, so whether it's um, the way that you know, it can be financial challenges can be chronic, mm-hmm. or again, um, a woman juggling motherhood, being a wife and a career, or just external events that um, you feel like you have no control over. So I think that there are a couple things we can do. If I want to talk about three of them, one would be mindfulness. And that mindfulness is basically... You could be practicing meditation just for, you know, you could start with five or 10 minutes a day and then build it up to 20 minutes or half an hour. So, but you can, my meditation is just a way of focusing on your breath and keep making your mind just keep coming back to the breath. So it's, it's, it's watching the contents of your mind, but with an anchor. And so when you just watch yourself breathe in slowly and breathe out and then you notice your mind wandering and you bring it back. It can get your mind into a different state. You may get a little bit more distance from your worries and you may, you know, kind of feel a bit more grounded and anchored in your breath. And that can create a relaxation response in your body. And the second thing I think is, is really working on controlling your thinking and your worry. Because um, what happens is, is 
when we're stressed, our minds can also go into kind of a tailspin where we're just worrying all the time, what's going to happen, and, you know, and sort of predicting the worst. And that's, that just makes the stress worse. It prolongs it. So another aspect of mindfulness in a way is, is really being able to kind of get that observer viewpoint on your mind and be able to check in, what's my mind doing now? And if you're ruminating, it's generally not helpful unless the way you're thinking about the problem is actually leading to a new insight or to a solution. If you're just going over and over the same worry, it would be important to, to learn how to become aware of that and to interrupt the cycle, whether it's that's by distracting yourself, getting up and doing something else, or listening to music, Whatever you do is okay, but it's more the point of just understanding that it's not helpful to sit and ruminate and you need to interrupt it. And the third thing I think is to kind of attune yourself to the positive, to bring positive energy into your life. And that can be by practicing gratitude for what you do have. I think when we under stress, our brains tend to go to the negative just automatically. That's what the amygdala does. And our focus tends to get quite narrow, like we're focusing on the thing that's threatening us. Um, by practicing gratitude, it, it can help rewire your your brain to be more positive. And, and so it's it's that it's making yourself, you know, really try to broaden the view in your life. So this piece is stressful, but you know, there's meaning. What is what in your life is meaningful? What loving relationships do you have? What's good about your work? What are you contributing? Those kind of things can help. And then finally, I think it's the self-care. It's actually making yourself take time out for you, to not letting go of some of the guilt and perfectionism. And you have to let some things go, even if your house is not so tidy, and so that you can make yourself a priority. You know, I think that's so important because I think that, um, you know, what can happen is there's – I notice, I know for me, the more stressed I, I am, I actually become a, more controlling. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to affect um, change or influence everywhere. And um, that's usually a sign for me that I am too stressed versus beginning to, um, to let go a little bit more, you know? Yeah. Controlling is a kind of a stressed energy. I think you're right. Again, because of that fight flight, it's like you've got to be doing something or you've got to be preventing some horrible outcome from happening. So you've got to control the people around right, you. Right, right. <laughs> but that's actually often, you know, it's not effective and not necessary and not helpful to yourself or to them. And so, yeah, watching your own energy can be a way of tuning in of whether you, t you, you need a break. I think controlling would be one, critical would be one. Yeah, critical is a big one. Yeah, I see. Um, I see in a lot of clients that there's a when they are stressed out, they're very hard on themselves and others. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's family members, exactly. And you know, I think anxiety and anger can be quite similar physiologically. They're both part of fight or flight. So sometimes the anxiety can be kind of make us more prone to anger or to reactivity when people aren't doing what we want and, you know, we don't have the time to feel like we don't have the time to deal with this teenager that's, you know, not doing their homework or talking back or whatever, or the, or whatever it is. So that's another one. And then also the kind of the criticism of ourselves. I think we can get really hard on ourselves when we're under stress. You've got to do more, more and more and more would be one way, you know, just being very demanding in a way that's, that's not helpful because you really do need rest as well. That way you can, you know, think more clearly and be more productive and make better decisions, what to fo what's most important to focus on, what to let go of. Um, so those are some ways that our energy gets kind of uh, in our way when we're under stress. You know, one of the, th the things that you um, talk about is a neuroplasticity. Can you go into that a little bit more for our listeners? Sure. And I think that's one of the, the more recent discoveries that's really so exciting. And that is that our brains actually possess neuroplasticity. We have billions of neurons in our brains that are all interconnected. And 
we can influence the wiring of our brain by just repeatedly, repeatedly practicing new habits and new ways of thinking. And it takes time for our brains to change. And it's not an overnight process. But the thing with our brains is that the pathways that we repeatedly use get much stronger. And the pathways that we don't use, the neurons tend to, you know, kind of wither and die or be disconnected. And so there's a saying that, that neurons that fire together wire together. Mm. So we can actually, by practicing new habits, for example, gratitude would be an example. We can actually strengthen pathways in our brain that maybe weren't so strong before. When we, when we interrupt the worry and rumination and criticism, and we deliberately direct our brain to may, maybe taking a broader view or, or thinking, how might I look at this more compassionately? Or how might I look about at this in a more open-minded way, way? We then are creating different pathways in our brain. We, we, we're kind of we're weakening the old negative patterns that we all have. And we, are cre we can create ways of thinking that are actually protective against stress and can help us be resilient and kinder to ourselves and others. Um, so that's why my book is called The Stress-Proof Brain. In a way, it's, it's the idea or the ideal of building a brain that can be resilient to stress, by, that our behavior can actually translate into physical structure. I, th I think that the, the concept of neuroplasticity is so important, too, because I think I know that for me, you know, when I'm trying to make changes and watching my clients trying to make changes, one of the things that they'll say often is like, this is so hard. Like, it's so hard to to change the way that I'm thinking. It's so much easier to think negatively. And, right, absolutely. And, and I think yeah. when you look at neuroplasticity, it helps you to see that, okay, it's not you. It's, you know, you're not the reason why it's so hard to change mm -hmm. this behavior. Your brain is wired to go down this pathway and this is really firing really strongly and and you have you're just beginning to lay down new new pathways and so it's much more difficult to to go that route yeah that's really important to understand also that change doesn't come overnight and how important it is to persist and to be patient with yourself because these old pathways were often things that we learned as ways to survive difficult environments in our childhood perhaps so, you know, in some families, it wasn't okay to express vulnerable feelings. We had to be strong and tough. And, and so learning to be that way was a way to survive in, that, in the new family. It was functional at the time. But then our brains cling to what has, have helped us survive, and it can get to a point that's not functional anymore. So the idea is not to be down on ourselves for having the pattern in the first place but rather to understand, well, that was helpful for then, but this is now, and we have new choices now that we didn't have then, but it's going to take time for our brains to adapt. Yeah. So that I think that's so important in therapy is, is that understanding. So Dr. Greenberg, I know that your, your book is chock full of different exercises and tools that people can use to help manage their stress. Can you share what some of your favorite ones are? Sure. <laughs> mindfulness is, is always my favorite. And, and besides meditation, mindfulness is just to practice being present. And so you can, you can weave mindfulness into your day. You can start when you're in the morning shower. Uh, often we get in the shower and our brains are already at work or our brains are already driving carpool. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's really deliberately, um, you know, maybe waking up that little bit earlier and bringing your brain back to the shower and back to feeling the hot water on your body and smelling the soap and seeing the bubbles and feeling your feet on the ground. When we connect with our senses, it's very calming to the nervous system. So that, so that would be a way to start your day being mindful. And then when you're driving, when you, just to when you find yourself at a traffic light, feeling frustrated to take a breath, maybe to focus on all the trees around you or the buildings around you and focus on your body and you know, breathe and open up some space. And then also to try to be mindful in the evening when you come home, take time to greet your family, 
you know, before you rush and, and do everything, just maybe take five minutes to check in with yourself, to think a positive thought. Um, so mindfulness is a big one, I think. I think another one might be savoring. And savoring is, is taking in the good. It's, it's kind of, it's trying to extend those good moments that might just be small moments. So, you know, when you, when you see your child at the end of a school day, it's taking in that moment of, you know, of like enjoying seeing them. Or when you're having a good conversation with your spouse, to just really breathe that in. Or if you go in your, in your garden and you see a pretty flower, just to really savor that, like just try to extend and breathe in and enjoy the pleasure of that experience. Um, if you're reading a book for five minutes, not that many people have the time to, but if you if you can actually manage to take the time, it's, it's just enjoying that that moment of leisure. Um, so that can make the experience greater than than what it actually is. So those are two favorite ones. I really like that one, savoring. I love the word because it reminds me of you know when you are maybe enjoying something really tasty, you know whether it's um yeah, a dish yeah. or something yummy and. Um, you know, just really enjoying the flavors. And what I can see with the savoring is it slows things down. Yeah, it really does. It slows things down and it redirects to the positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our brains tend to be wired to the negatives, as we were talking about a little bit earlier indirectly. So your brain is designed to keep you alive, not necessarily to keep you happy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes sense, though. You know, if you look back in time that you know the priority was to survive you know <laughs> exactly yeah like, if you don't get away from the tiger then there's no you know there'll be nothing left of you to smell the flower so that's how our brains are wired it's all about survival and it's and you know the positive is secondary so we, what happens is our brains will take in the negative and make much more of it and we tend to miss the positive unless we consciously focus on it so that's where savoring can help us compensate for that, make the positive bigger. And I know you said you had a third one, Dr. Greenberg. Yeah. Another one is self-compassion. Mm. And self-compassion is trying to extend to yourself the same kindness and care that you might sort of to any, you saw any other living being who was struggling and it's to compensate for being so hard and harsh and critical with yourself. Part of self-compassion is the idea of common humanity, like we're only human, everybody makes mistakes, and you don't have to you know, never make a mistake or to, to get so down on yourself if you do make a mistake, because you know, there's actually a lot of good things that you do, and you're often under a lot of stress, so it's natural you're going to make some mistakes. Why is it that, you know, that that happens, that we can be so compassionate with others, but it's so much harder to do with ourselves? Yeah, it's so interesting. I think we're harshest with our, with ourselves. I it may be that again a wiring thing that we kind of wired. We had to get along. We lived in tribes. Our ancestors lived in tribes, and so they had to fit in with the tribe and get along with others because if they got kicked out, they wouldn't survive. So I think maybe we do have this wiring thing. We have mirror neurons in our brain where we tend to the mirror neurons make us. When we see someone feeling pain, we almost feel pain in ourselves. And so I think we're wired like that, you know, to fit in because of the survival aspects. But it doesn't come as naturally to be kind to yourself. And again, it's something you have to learn and maybe even overcome resistance to. As a woman as well, I think we socialize to take care of other people. And, you know, if you're a woman who's focused, who takes care of yourself, you, you can be criticized for it in society. Yeah. There's a lot of negative stereotypes around that. So I think that, that for women in particular, like we're, we're more guilty and we're more focused on taking care of the whole world and, and more likely to feel selfish if we focus on ourselves. But that's not actually the case because if you take good care of yourself, it actually helps you. There's, there's more, more of you that's more resilient to take good care of others. And I think too, you know, you had mentioned earlier about anxiety and anger. And I think, um, you know, you just made me uh, think about this, that for women, I would say in general, women are socialized to, to be harmonious and relational and mm -hmm. they're not very comfortable with conflict or asserting mm -hmm. themselves. It's, it's, 
it's more difficult, I think, for a woman to express those parts of herself. And I can see how that can, you know, become very stressful. Yeah. I mean, I think it's two things. I think women are not socialized to, you know, to take on other people and for, for conflict. And the other thing is that other people are not always likely to react as positively to a woman who is very assertive. So it's both. So it, but at the same time, it's important to be assertive. It's especially, it's important to set boundaries. So, cause if you say yes to everybody, then you get more and more stressed and, and you don't, you won't do anything well, or you won't find anything rewarding or, or it will come out as resentment. So it's a way of learning to set boundaries and be mindful about what you say yes to and what you don't say yes to. That's really important in managing your stress as well. And I also wanted to add, you know, I, I'm really thankful that when you talked about mindfulness, you you expanded that it's it's not because a lot of times think mindfulness is meditation, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> and there, and I'm yeah. so glad you you described that it's also about just being fully present and aware of your, what's happening with your senses as you move through the day, and it can be as simple as when you're walking to your car or walking into your garage, just being aware of everything around you and the the signs and the sounds and the textures and the smells. You know, I, I remember um, one time I, when I was working at a different office and I was practicing this mindfulness as I walked out to my car and I realized that I hadn't even known that there was a particular business two doors down from mine <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, had, I had just not paid attention. I had been uh -huh. com coming to this office for about three months. So, yeah. I know. We spend so much of our lives on automatic pilot. Especially when I think when we're busy moms, you know, uh, or busy working moms or stay at home moms, just so busy, just trying to get everything done. But then, you know, you miss out if you do that, you miss out on, on there's something about being present that is, is also gives you a kind of a, a quality of life, a quality of experiencing amidst all the busyness. That's really, it's really important. Dr. Greenberg, thank you so much for um, for sharing your insights today. I know that our listeners will be interested in learning more about you and finding out, you know, more about your book. So, can you share that, please? Sure. My book is called The Stress Proof Brain, and it's published by New Harbinger, and it's available on Amazon and other outlets. And I also, if you want to follow some of my other work. I have a blog called The Mindful Self-Express. It's on psychology today. And so you would just have to Google Mindful Self-Express. And I also have a website, www.drmelaniegreenberg.com, where you can read more articles and more resources. I even have some free stuff to download, like a, a poster about managing your stress at work. And We'll be sure to include the links to all of the resources you mentioned um, so that our listeners can get in touch with you, learn more about you, and buy your book. And thank you. And I also offer coaching and therapy. So I have a therapy practice in Mill Valley, California, and I also do some coaching work online, nationally and internationally. Wonderful. We'll make sure to include all of this in the show notes. And um, that way, anyone who wants to learn more about you or work more about you can, can get that information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And take gentle care. Take gentle care too. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Dr. Greenberg. One of the aspects that stood out for me is the connection between anxiety and anger. It also grabbed my attention when she spoke about neuroplasticity and that neurons that fire together, wire together. And this also holds the key to why we can begin to create new neural pathways and build a brain that is more resilient to stress. And also, when Dr. Greenberg was sharing some tips for coping with stress and building this more resilient brain, I love the suggestion she made about savoring, taking in the good, taking that time, slowing things down when you are experiencing something pleasurable, something enjoyable, picking up your kids from school, enjoying your morning coffee, but just really 
savoring those moments. For show notes to today's episode and for links to any of the resources mentioned, please visit www.lourdesfiado.com forward slash women in depth. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe on iTunes or share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.